Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. Joining me is our whiz kid, Marco. And today we're going to talk about high horology in sports watches. Well, first, I want to start with not so much a definition, but how do you define high horology? When most people hear the terminology of high horology, they think of you know some kind of u uber complicated or grand complication timepiece with ridiculous functions and complications and things like that. But that's not necessarily true in your opinion, is it? Yeah, when I think of high horology, I think of a watch that essentially is handmade to a certain extent, right? Be it in the finishing of its movement, its case and or its bracelet. And usually it's a combination of the three that allows it to be considered a high horology watch, right? At least that's, that's what it is in terms of the dress watch form. Uh, obviously you can get into uber complications. Those are kind of going to the grand complications. But in terms of high horology, when I think high horology, I think handmade watchmaking, right? Artisanal watchmaking. Going back to the days of, you know, the 30s and 40s when watchmakers would labor and, and create movements and dials and, and cases and, and bracelets when each little by hand. was done by hand. Correct. Uh, so in my opinion, high horology, I'll be honest, I, wa I was and still sort of that guy that tends to say, Yo, you know, if you want to talk about high horology, give me a minute repeater, give me a tourbillon, some kind of complex perpetual calendar or split second chrono, right? Or a well-made chronograph, if you will. But at the same token, I also add the history element to it. For me, uh, I'm in agreement with what you said, and to dumb it down, I would say it has to check off all the boxes, whether it be finishing, whether it be made well, whether it be complicated. But at the end of the day, I think it comes down to the brand name, right? There are certain brands that we consider high horology. You look at an independent watchmaker, my favorite, I'm being a from a perspective of complications and innovations, as well as how well the watch is made, certainly high horology timepieces. Right? Yeah. But I still feel like that longevity, that time in business, if you will, starting out from scratch when every single wheel was made by hand going back 100 or 200 years, like in the likes of Louis Breguet or Audemars Piguet of Acheron, that's where high horology has to meet all the check boxes. To me, and history is a big part of it. And no surprise that, especially when we're talking about the sports genre, there's not a lot of brands out there that are making high horology or complicated pieces in the sports genre, right? Yeah, I think it's also important to define what is a sports watch, right? Because whenever people talk sports watches, um, I, I guess I personally may have a different definition to, for example, somebody like yourself, right? A lot of people will look at a sports watch and think it has to be on bracelet, for example, which I personally think a rubber strap uh, will will be, you know, it's really comes down to what, what the vibe of the watch is, right? D does it evoke a kind of sporty nature to it? Um, so yeah, I, I would say sports watch is, one, is it a sporty look to it? Is it something that you can wear kind of dressed down casually? And then two, high horology, I would say, is something that has some kind of handmade element to it. And last but not least, the common misconception is uh, a chronograph being a sports watch. Not necessarily, there are plenty of chronographs out there from Brigade, from Vacheron, and Patek Philippe's that I wouldn't consider a sports watch because it still has the vibe of a dress watch. A watch on a leather strap can be a sports watch, but at the end of the day, these are opinions, right? Yeah. These are not facts, and so this is a bit of a loose topic when we're talking about um, you know, sports watches. So uh, no surprise, we picked out Vacheron Constantine, Audemars Piguet, and Patek Philippe, i.e. the Holy Trinity, to go over uh, some high horology uh, within a sports watch. What do you want to start with? Yeah, let's start with my probably favorite brand of the Holy Trinity, and that is Vacheron Constantine. As he reaches for the original <laughs> yeah. Vacheron Constantine I mean, 222. So, something pretty special, which is kind of their first, I would say their first real integrated bracelet sports watch uh, that Vacheron made. You know, this is only second Vacheron 222, the original, what I've held in my hands in my entire career? Yeah, it's uh, certainly a rare watch. Obviously, this dates back to 1977 uh, to commemorate the 222nd anniversary of Vacheron Constantin. And, and also the race of luxury sports watch yeah, kind of played a role there. I mean, I right. think. 
Yeah, no doubt about it, right? You had, obviously, Audemars Piguet come out with the Royal Oak in 1972. The Nautilus come out, I believe it was 75 or 76, actually. 76, in yeah, between you had the Ingenieur. And then in between, yeah, you had the IWC Ingenieur, not to mention also the GP Laureato. And then uh, we ultimately had, in 1977, Vacheron's take on their own integrated braces. A little late to the game, I guess they were, but... Yeah, I think, I think they saw the popularity of the Royal Oak, they saw the Nautilus, and they saw a certain shift in consumer demand, and they had to, they had to come out with their own answer. So they played it safe. Yeah, absolutely. I think in terms of the look to it, um, when I look at the 222, even I can say this for the one that was just released, the Hysterix 222, it's almost a little bit of a dated design when you compare it to something like this, which I think is a much more modern look to it, which is the overseas 4500V in this case. When I look, when I compare these two watches, although they, ha they share a similar design DNA, they come kind of from the same family, they look so wildly different. One almost evokes that bygone era. The other is very much a modern sports watch. But if you're talking about high horology, now here's, here are watches that are almost 50 years apart. Yeah. But unmistakably, there's not an individual out there that may say that a hey, uh, that's not a sports watch, right? It's unmistakably a sports watch. Where's the high horology part comes in? If we were to compare this for, say for example, the most popular sports watch, arguably of all times, the Rolex Daytona, right? If you go back to when it was first made in the 70s, this was a handmade watch at the time, right? Because obviously computers weren't available, you know, you couldn't see and see things. Essentially, they, they were made, everything was made by hand. And you go to back to something like this, which was also made in the 70s. This was also made by hand. The bracelet was made by hand. The dial was made by hand. The, the, the loom was applied by hand. Uh, everything, even the movement was finished and, and put together, cut out. Everything was, was made essentially by hand by artisans, right? Artis artisanal watchmakers, each making individual components and then putting these together to create a finished product. And when you, when you compare that to today, a Daytona is made in scale, it's mass produced. Often, you know, it, it's, it's made industrially, right? It, it's, it, it's stamped out. These are, these are processes that are made in terms of industrial Listen, We have this thing called the CNC machines. Now, yeah, right? I mean, I mean not, not just CNC machines, things are made on an assembly line. They just, that's just the way they are. However, if you look that and compare that to the VC 4500V overseas, this is still very much made by hand. And you can tell that just by the way that the bracelet is finished, the way that the case is finished, the dial is finished, and most importantly, the movement, right? This is actually stamped with the Geneva seal. Uh, the Geneva Geneva Hallmark being probably, I would say, the most you know high prestigious uh, it's award. It's the most prestigious. Yeah, the most prestigious award you can have in a watch in terms of finishing, right? Now, before previously, the Geneva Seal needed updating because it wasn't for a fully cased watch. Uh, it was just really in terms of the movement. That's why you had you know the likes of a Roger Dubuis pass a Geneva Seal test with a very you know minimally finished watch. But nowadays, it has to be for a fully cased up watch. They look at the dial case movement, and, and it really has to pass these quite rigorous standards. So that, that would definitely put it in that high horology. Well, you, you actually got ahead of my next question is to say, well, here we are 50 years later with all the technology in the world. How is this still a high horology watch? And you just literally answer that question without me asking it. Yeah. And we don't practice for this, by the way. Sometimes we just see eye to eye. So it's, it's a brush of fresh air to see you know, two watches similar in design, both sports watches, still keep up the standards of high horology 50 years later. And it's somewhat sad to see that, you know, if, if we had, you know, surprisingly, there's no Rolex up here because current model Rolexes, in terms of their finishing, in terms of how they're made, sort of don't meet our opinion of what high horology is. Yeah. And if I took a Daytona from 50 years ago and set it next to Daytona today, we could not have made that comparison. Yeah, and now, you can even take the, the sports watch genre and take it one step further, right? Because you'll have essentially an overseas, but you'll take it even a step further in that, yes, it's a sporty watch. You could put this on a rubber stripe, although it's on leather currently, and add a grand complication to it. This being a perpetual calendar chronograph, which is also self-winding. So it's an automatic perpetual calendar chronograph with the moon phase. So you, there, there are levels to, to even sports watches themselves. And with Vacheron, I mean, they take it all the way out to a Turbion uh, within the Vacheron Constantine overseas case. Uh, they have dual time pieces with power reserve indicators and all kinds of things. So, but this is probably, I'm glad we started with this because this is probably the purest example of how you started out the video by saying, hey, it's really about how the watch is made to what standard, if you will. Yeah. Right? And I think Vacheron is a perfect example to start with, but let's segue into the Rolls Royce of watch out. Let's talk about Patek Philippe. Which one do you want to go with first? Uh, well, let's start with the OG, the let's one that's Let's start with the original. Let's start with the 3700 and the Patek Philippe 3700, 1976, Gerald Genta. Uh, Gerald Genta 
thought that the Royal Oak was his greatest design, but the one that would really bring him fame was the Nautilus. And I think that's certainly the case, right? Because out of the three, I would say personally, the one that has the most demand, you know, excluding the grand complications, the, the Nautilus, you know, pound for pound, it will be more popular. So I would definitely agree with that assessment. But and, that's and just, that's just comes with the territory. Look, Patek yeah. Philippe is the Rolls Royce of all watches. That's yeah. the analogy I tend to make. Patek Philippe is it. It is the upper echelon, right? Yeah. And oddly enough, there are plenty of brands out there, the likes of Richard Mille, that sell for tremendous amounts of money for just a simple chronograph, which I shouldn't say that, foyer chronograph. There's nothing simple about a chronograph. But with that said, I made by hand, same exact process. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit, and I'm gonna bring up a Nautilus that you actually don't see often. Now, if you guys remember history, at the time that the 3700 came out, the biggest complaint people had was that it was too big yeah. for its time. So at the same time as the 3700 came out, they came out with um, uh, the 3800s, which was a smaller version. Fast forward to what, a 16 year break, right? Yeah, so actually the 3700 was discontinued in 1990 and then they hadn't made anything, uh, I believe it was 2006 for the 30th anniversary of the Nautilus. Is when the 5711 came out and yeah. alongside the 5711 came out, which we don't happen to have one, yeah. alongside the 5711 came out the 5800s, which was basically the younger sister or brother to the 3800 that came alongside the 3700 when he came out in the uh, mid 70s. With that said, it, there was an interesting flip-flop that happened at the time because 2006 is when we started seeing the rise in popularity of larger, bigger, and better, right? Uh, you're talking offshores, we're talking, you know, Royal Oaks were less popular than offshores and things of that nature, right? And the 5711 wasn't really a big hit and the 5800 was definitely not a big hit. And uh, what ended up happening is while the 3700 era, people were like, this is way too big and they opted for the 3800. The 3800, believe it or not, retail for slightly more money than the 3700. That was a that was a most ridiculous thing. It was a bigger watch that sold for less than a smaller one because it just wasn't selling as well. Come 2006, you couldn't give away a 5800. And that's why, end result, this is an uber rare watch that you can hardly come across. You just don't see them because they didn't make very many because it was like oh, damn near zero demand for them. It was just way too small, yeah. right? But what did they do? They literally made the same exact two watches, 3700, 3800 and then 5711 and 5800. Let's talk about the high horology aspect. Yeah, again, we're talking about handmade watches, handmade uh, case, handmade movement, uh, hand finish movement rather. And all of these these will be components that are hand finished to a very high degree, right? Particularly nah. being Geneva seal. Uh, not in these cases. So, so in these cases, actually, no. This would probably likely have a Geneva seal. Uh, it, it was in 2000, I want to say 2006 actually, or 2008, sorry, that Patek Philippe stopped using the Geneva seal that went in-house. So I don't know the exact year, but it's possible this still has the Geneva seal, making it even rarer. So yeah, in terms of high horology, uh, fit, finish, uh, even in terms of the, the movement standards, very, very high degree, high level watchmaking. Now, I want to take a look at the market, right? Because when you started in the business, I'm sure the Nautilus was not the, what it is today. Not at all, it was not a, at all popular like it if is I today. If I could tell you some of the pricing, <laughs> it's, 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 it's borderline, it's insane, but let's go ahead and ask. Yeah, so I, I mean, I wanted to kind of give my theory for it, right? When, when you look at the early 2000s, or the mid 2000s rather, when the, the Nautilus came out, it was kind of a flop. There's just no other way to describe it, right? It took almost pretty much a, a decade, almost 15 years before the Nautilus really gained popularity and it, you know, it required social media and celebrities wearing the watch. And to me, the reason why personally was because you look at that gap, that 16 year gap from 1990 to 2006 is really important. Essentially in the minds of Patek collectors, they'd gotten so used to not having a high horology sports watch in the range that it just became insignificant to them. And I think that's part of the reason why the Nautilus uh, initially didn't have kind of the following it does today was because maybe collectors had just forgot about how collectible or how important a watch it was. But so let me, let me, let me yeah. paint a picture for you guys. So Marco is six years old and uh, he's <laughs> flipping through Seven. watch magazines yeah. and he's putting theories together as to why the 5711 is not as popular as he thought it should be because it's so iconic. He calls uh, Tech Philippe, you know, he still talks like a baby and uh, I think you're a little too deep on that and I'll tell you why. You have, to, you have to be in the times and look at the times, at the times of those mid-2000s, mm -hmm. right? Leading up to the 08 crisis, right? This is where we are. Patek Philippe, the flex in Patek Philippe was dressy, complicated pieces. That was your flex. 
we were talking about the time where they came out with the annual chrono, the first. Yeah, the, even something like the this. The 59.60. Oh, let's, let's, let's put one up, right? Yeah. The 59.60, the first one they came out was its platinum version uh, with a gray dial, right? Yeah. And that watch came out of the gate retailing for low 50s, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the secondary market on it was around $80,000. Right. It was also the era of people taking paddocks and putting them away in their safes double sealed. It got so bad that, uh, you know, Patek threatened their authorized dealers that they will take their dealership away if they were to find a watch that came through them that's still sealed. Like, because it became a frenzy, a, a regular watch, let's say if it was a regular watch was a dollar, a double sealed version was a dollar twenty. Like yeah, it was which a is big, even more today, right? Uh, because the double seal version. Nobody cares anymore. Really? That, that actually went away. We wow. can talk about that separately. It went away because at the end of the day, people are buying watches and they want to wear them. Nobody's yeah, out that's there. True. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that, and that, that kind of went away, went away quickly. You know? And my thing to clients was always like, guys, these are not stamps. Like, <laughs> you don't keep them sealed in a plastic case or like co rare coins or something, right? And at that time, if you had to tell me, Roman, pinpoint the hottest watch, the hottest watch at the time was the 5970s. They were the hottest ticket in town. To go a little bit backwards, 5070s, people wanted a set of 5070s, the Lamania movements. To go backwards, uh, during that time frame, people put together the sets of the 10 day power reserves that they made for the Millennium, the year 2000, they commemorated yeah. the Millennium with the uh, Gondolo, with, the, with the Gondolo yeah. style, and it was yellow, rose, platinum, whatever. and white gold, right? Yeah, they yeah. came with a coin, and a whole, I have one of those coins. Uh, but the hottest watch back then was a 5970. Now mind you, everything else, it's, it's, like, it's like the same thing but flip-flop today, right? Yeah. When you have something that's an outbreak that's most popular, that's, it's gonna drive the rest up. That drove the stainless steel line up. But the ones that were driven up really were the Kronos because they were so new. The 5980s were newer, right? Yeah. And it drove up the price of those from, you know, upwards of 50 to 55,000 at the time. The list price on the watch, I think, was 30,000 or 28,000, right? So this is the era that you're in. And that's not, the 5711 also was driven up in price, right? And yes, I remember 5711s at around the $10,000 price range. I remember buying a 3710 for 6,000. I remember buying Aquanauts for $4,000, $5,000, right? The older ones. And it was just a different time where it's completely the opposite. And it's cool to look at that stretch of time throughout the years and see what it is today, how times change. And now we are flip-flop where your stainless steel pieces are uber desirable in terms of price versus MSRP, uh, in terms of demand, and the dressier stuff, like some of the stuff that come out as of late, like the newer annual calendars, which is absolutely amazing. They blow any of these out of the water. Yeah. But what is mostly cool to see is the same exact trend. Your top echelon in popularity in a brand, regardless if it's a cheaper watch or more expensive, will still pull up the others. That's what we saw in the last year. That's what we saw during Corona. We saw the popularity of you know watches that normally would discount also get to MSRP and above because of the overall popularity. This is the reason behind a 5711 seemingly not being the hottest thing back then because there were things that were just more popular and hotter at the time. Yeah. It's that simple. And you know, things we always discuss things come and go in waves, right? And you still see that even in today's markets. It's, it's incredible actually to give that that kind of insight because when you look at the, the modern watch market, 5811 obviously is doing its own thing. It's a brand new release, so still very popular. But you look back 5711, 5712, the less complicated Nautilus models are actually performing way worse than, for example, your, your chronographs, uh, 5980, 5990, the, those are actually not only stabilized in price, but have started going up in value. And the reason, I guess, is going back to that idea, right, early 2000s when Patek collectors looked to those higher level complications. And it's interesting, right, because- Because the flex was in the complication, the complication. not the Instagram post. Yeah. Not the flex over wearing a stainless steel watch that's plain Jane, doesn't do much of anything, and spending a hundred thousand plus on it. There was a different type of flex. And guess what? I have news for you guys and I have news for you. We're about to see yet another flip-flop. We're seeing it already. You know, the whole flex of uh, dressy watch with sweatpants, as Adrian put it, uh, people coming back to the drawing board and saying, wait a minute, this is a perpetual calendar. This is an annual calendar. This is a perpetual corona, right? And again, any market, not just watch markets, trends will change. Trends will often flip-flop. What's popular today won't be popular tomorrow, but then will be popular the next day. This happens in every market, and especially when it comes to a collector's market, like the market of watches, because I still am a true believer that a watch market is a collector's market. 
you're going to see that happen from time and time again. And this is why you see Marco with his little corny Instagram posts that say, don't sleep on this, don't <laughs> sleep on that. And this is what we mean by that when we say don't sleep on it, because, you know, yes, a bit easier for me to say, because I've seen 20 years of this and I've seen things come and go and flip flop. But for the most part, um, we're gonna make that video. I'm gonna have Ian go back. Ian, you ready for this one? You're gonna go back and you're gonna scrub through the old videos where any video that I talked about sleepers. I hope you have a software that can detect the word sleeper because I've done it a lot. And I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna show clips of that video and I'm gonna tell you what the price is today because again, the whole point of me getting on YouTube and started this whole thing is to be transparent. Yeah. And I don't mind telling you guys that this is what the sleeper is today and yeah. it will recognize more value because that has become a lot more important, which is another trend, the value than it was when I was starting out. Because when I was starting out, people knew that they were gonna buy a watch, the minute they put it on their wrist, it's going to look X amount of value. If they bought it on a secondary, it's not gonna be as much. If they bought it from an AD, they're losing 30%. And that's just the thing. Now, I have to ask, because we got insight into the realm of Patek Philippe, and one that is my, my personal favorite of the Holy Trinity is Vacheron, right? Now, Vacheron is still very much a newcomer in the sense that they experience, I guess, a lot of the stimulus hype uh, you know, COVID hype, uh, and, and kind of came into the fold as you I know think that they backed off the royal. Open that there's yeah, I, I would say so also, right? What was the the Vacheron market like? You know, back in the day, did people just didn't care? Back when I started, I can order any Vacheron at um, ten over cost, right? Ten over dealer cost. Dealer cost is forty five off. How much is ten percent over cost, Marco? You tell me. Well, if I'm if dealer cost is forty five off and I'm buying ten over his cost, what's my cost? Uh, Thirty nine. 39.5% close. Most people will say 40 off, right? But with that said, uh, Vacheron is a brand that I could order at 10 over cost from a multitude of dealers, literally you know, 20, 30 different dealers that carried the brand. Then Asia happened. Popularity of Vacheron Constantine increased tremendously. Around the year, I'm gonna say 2005, 2006, it was both Vacheron and Piaget. And, uh, the Asian population, much like the Russians, we believe in all these weird superstitions. And I think it had something to do with that. And don't quote me on this, but speaking with some of, some of my Asian clients, it was like a, some, some sort of a superstitious thing. They brought good luck or something like that. We're well aware that uh, you know, if you're, let's say, in Taipei and you want a license plate that reads 8888, it can cost you upwards of a million and a half to have that license plate, right? Because it means life, prosperity, and all those good things. Fours are no good. Uh, you will not find uh, someone, an Asian client buying a watch that's number four. Uh, but with that said, because it means death. Yeah. With that said, uh, Russians would never buy a number six. Uh, there's just a lot of different uh, things that are out there, but that's irrelevant. Piaget and Vacheron picked up popularity in Asia and it, and it picked up on steroids. And people say, well, was it because they all follow each other or what? No, it's because there's a humongous Asian population in the world. That's, it's just a numbers game, right? Yeah. And with that said, that's when you started seeing Vacheron popularity and discounts go down. All of a sudden, I'm getting 30 off. All of a sudden, I'm getting 20 off. Same goes for Piaget, brands that I could normally get great discounts on. And then, Vacheron did an interesting thing. They cut dealer discount on overseas models down to 25 off to a dealer. So now, a 10, 10 over cost is a lot less of a discount. And they made a disparity between retail pricing in Asia versus United States, so you couldn't transship where, because their retail was slightly lower, so it wouldn't make sense for somebody from here to sell it to there because Asian market was their number one market. Somebody gave me a statistics about a, either Piaget or Vacheron Boutique in Hong Kong did more business than all boutiques combined worldwide. Like it was something insane. Right. And that's when we saw that happen. But then we also saw the crisis of 2008 and everything kind of reset. It's not like what happened six months where you had, you know, top five, maybe 3% of the most popular models out there go from 3X to 2X, right? That, that, no, that was a lot worse. At post-crisis, uh, 598 in Autolysis, I was buying for $25,000, $26,000, just to put things in perspective. But that's what happened with Vacheron throughout. Then, after the, the Great Reset, there were brands that picked back up and, and slowly started growing, growing strong. Vacheron wasn't one of those brands. Yeah. And, when, and I think the reasoning behind it was is because Vacheron was one of those brands that went very, very high in terms of pricing and felt very, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Yeah. And they loved the bad taste in collector's mouths, right? I think they also had a, a weird period, I would say, from like 2000 to about like the mid 2010s when they had a ton of change in ownership. 
Uh, they had a lot of dog designs. Like they were just ugly watches. Like I'll yeah. be the first one to say, it. like yes. they were really ugly. Yeah. And uh, let me let me. How about the world time that they made? It was just like oh. I mean, was... I mean, there was like so like even for example, they used like a lot of JLC movements. It was a weird period that that even I would even go back a little bit further, like mid '90s all the way to about the 20, mid 2010s. Uh, once they released the the kind of overseas in 2016, the third generation, it's really when things started to I would say change. change third point. generation uh, overseas definitely perfected the overseas, if yeah. you will. Although I'm a big fan of the first generation, it's sort of that, it gives you that same flimsier feel that you get from an older Samaritan. It's a weird look, man. It, it, it's it, very dated. It, it, it is dated, but I think yeah. it's, 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 because it's, it's starting to get that true vintage feel and yeah. vibe to it, yeah. which is why I probably like the first generation. Second generation was neither here or there. The third generation, they perfected it, and what happens when they perfected it? All of a sudden, we have the hype. Yeah. of the steel sports models and yeah. the gold sports models, i.e. your Royal Oak, your Nautiluses, and people are starting to look at, wait a minute, Vacheron is no worse. It's part of the Holy Trinity. It is a high horology watch. It's made extremely well till this day. It's as historic, arguably more historic, being the longest, being the longest running company in, yeah. in, in the world. It is more historic if you yeah. think about it. And that's when people realize, wait a minute, there's value there. And the minute that's realized and the secondary market picks up on it, same thing. It takes yeah. off. Well, I would say this. The Vacheron market definitely piggybacked on something like this. Is the the we got to talk about the, the well let's the, let's let's take it to my favorite maybe, brand maybe the most iconic sports watch of all time in terms of designs right designs being like the greatest blank canvas ever the greatest blank canvas ever i.e the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak uh, I think and again I'm biased this is my favorite brand but I think Audemars Piguet defines high horology for me because a they're the only brand that have the highest complications done in the Royal Oak case because of it being a blank canvas and the plainest watches 5402 Gerald Genta knocks it out of the park, draws a thing on a napkin overnight, designs the watch, comes out in the market, and the people are saying, are you out of your mind? $22 or $2,300 for a stainless steel watch at the time where you can pick up a Rolex for $150, which is nothing but a tool watch. Yeah. And people were shocked and Not, awed. That, that's without even mentioning the fact that this was released literally in the midst of the quartz crisis. In, in the midst? It literally was released as it started taking yeah. effect. So, so in, in the midst of the quartz crisis, we, you get a, a high horology sports watch, never been done before. And it's the watch I would honestly say helped lift the industry out of the quartz crisis. People love to hate on the Royal Oak nowadays because Audemars Piguet uses it so much, right, in, in terms of you know their, their lines, offshores, concepts, uh, you go down the list. But it's one of the most, if not the most important watches ever made, period. I'm gonna equate uh, the flex of 1972 uh, to the flex of having a richer meal. Uh, and I'm not talking about now, the hot times, I'm talking about even three, four years ago, where uh, before it actually went super crazy, right? When it started to go crazy. It's the flex of, hey, look at me, I have an RM10 on. It's a plain watch that shows date and time, and you know it's at least $100,000. And I think I would equate that to back to 1772, because here you are, you can buy this new technology that's so uber accurate and so much better than a mechanical movement uh, for a couple of dollars, literally, yeah. and here I am, I'm wearing a stainless steel watch, still handmade, still high horology from an respective brand, and it cost me $3,000 or whatever it was at yeah. the time. And that's, where, and that's where I think that those that actually bought those watches, that's where the flex came in, if you will. Because if you think that we live in flex culture today, flex culture has always been around, it just hasn't been so much in your face, if you will. Right. And, but there were some minuses there, right? You know, and one of the minuses was that, hey, people felt like they weren't getting a value because it's a steel watch. To them, a steel Rolex or a steel Swiss made watch was nothing but a tool, right? It wasn't really that big of a flex, right? It was still somewhat of a flex, but not as big as it is today. So what did they start doing? They start coming out with the gold versions right away, the white gold version. They added diamonds on a dial to show added value because that watch didn't sell for much more than the steel counterpart in terms of the retail price. And that's where, you see a rare example like the 5402 BC with a diamond dial. And you know what's interesting? In the conversation of high horology sports watches, one brand that's almost never brought up is JLC because they don't have that high horology sports watch. And yet, 
in a, an original Royal Oak 5402, 3700, and 222, like we've shown, they're all powered by the same caliber, the JLC 920, which is like probably one of the most legendary calibers. It's even featured in, in other watches here here on the table, uh, which we can get into. And I actually want to find a, a, a cheaper watch that use use that movement, pull the movement out, so take, actually, take it take, take it apart, and like mm -hmm. put it in a membrane case, just like to just like to, to display. So you know what's interesting? That that movement has only ever been used by the Holy Trinity. It's never even been used by JLC. So it was exclusively done by JLC for the. I'm use sure I can find of, a movement on of, eBay somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you can find. <laughs> A third, like a, a movement that's been pulled out of a watch, but it was actually exclusively kept for Patek Philippe, Vacheron, Constantin. Was that a Audemars contract, Piguet. or that's just what they decided? I don't know. That's a good question, actually. I don't but know about it's, that. it's never actually been used by anybody else. It's, I did not know that. Yeah, it's Learned pretty, something pretty interesting. Yeah. But let's talk about uh, you know what I tend to lean towards when you're talking about high horology. Yes, handmade. Yes, history. Yes, uh, hand finished uh, to the highest standards. Geneva seal. Blah blah blah. All those things are great. But I still am the guy that's gonna say, hey, give me wow complications, show me something uber complicated that others simply cannot do. And I think Audemars Piguet is the only bread that did it best. Vacheron caught up later with the Turbion yeah. in the Vacheron, but that was at a much later time. But, but Audemars Piguet didn't stop. They took the blank canvas and they said, now we're gonna flex. And yeah. their flex is what they started as. They started as a company that made high complications for Tiffany, and you start seeing things like perpetual calendars. Yeah, this was really the first, I would say, grand complication or complication of any kind. These these perpetual calendars, also a JLC 920 base with a perpetual calendar module uh, added on top. So you know, some of the some of the most, most historic watch, and what I love about this is it shows the variety in the Royal Oak, right? Here you have a yellow gold skeleton. Here you have a stainless steel perpetual calendar with a white platinum head. bezel. And here you have, uh, it's actually, I think it's uh, steel and platinum, right? It's a platinum bezel stainless steel case. Yeah, so it's no, but I think even the, the center links are platinum. So the, the it's a reference number SP. SP, yeah. yeah. So steel, steel and platinum, right? So that combination of metals with the, the perpetual calendar. Yeah, all, all of these, again, when you talk about high horology, hand finish, uh, hand finish case, hand finish uh, bracelet, of course, which I think is probably, in terms of look of a bracelet, probably the most distinct and the best looking bracelet ever made is a royal. I will agree with you 100% on that. I am among the trinity, if you will, among yeah. their plain Janes, if you want to call it that. If you take, if I had to actually put them in order, I am going with Royal Oak first, bracelet of the Royal Oak, then I'm going with the bracelet of the Vacheron, even to include the older style bracelet. Yeah. And then I'm going with the bracelet of Patek Philippe. And yeah. not that I'm saying this is bad and this is good, I'm just saying that's the order I would put them in. And of course, Audemars Piguet being Audemars Piguet, they go on and they start making Royal Oak Turbion, like this 25th anniversary of Royal Oak Turbion. Uh, yeah. And then later iterations up until today, you move on to some of the modern stuff that uh, you know you see today. Probably one of the most popular Royal Oaks out there today, and that is the Skeleton Double Balance. Right? Yeah. Started with a single, uh, started with the 39 millimeter version, and then they doubled up on the balance to make the watch more accurate. Yeah. Did a tremendous job. A watch that still trades way over its retail value. In fact, every Royal Oak that we've pulled out of here be it vintage or be it brand or be the current models, they all trade over list still, even after the dip. Uh, Royal Oaks were also the ones that suffered the dip the most because they were the most popular in terms of pricing, but again. I think it was also an unfortunate time. It, when you look at the Royal Oak, it's unfortunate in the sense that the 50th anniversary of the Royal Oak came essentially as the market was starting to cool off, right? It, came, what, it came as the market was just about to correct. Correct, and, and, and what you saw was a ton of essentially auctions and, and you know special Royal Oaks come to surface, right? Because people wanted to sell out of these, the 50th anniversary hype, right? They wanted to cash in essentially. And so it made a lot of these watches seem a lot less rare than they actually are. And I think what you're starting to see now is a lot more collectors saying like, oh crap, these are the deals, right? That's why you're seeing the likes of a double balance wheel or of a uh, of a skeleton perpetual. Oh, how Sorry. about the fact that the 50th anniversary is literally disappearing off the market? Yeah, because those you, that understand that, yep. the, like that watch is the future of what this watch is today, with the Turbion uh, yeah. anniversary. It's it's for those that know know, and you know when I say don't sleep on the 50th anniversaries, even though they're still trading over list, I say if you're in a hobby for the long haul, definitely put one away. And you know what's interesting too is we talk about the watchmaking of of Patek Philippe and of Vacheron Constantin, but seldom do collectors almost talk about the the watchmaking of AP, right? So we look at even something like a double balance wheel, adding the double balance to increase uh, the accuracy by thirty percent in the watch. Now 
they take that even a step further. This, I don't know if you know the story of the original, the 15305, but essentially the CEO at the time, Francois, saw that, that watch on a watchmaker. Yeah, because wrist. they're allowed to make their own watches. Yeah, because they're allowed to actually make their own complications, watches, right. whatever. And he saw that and he thought it was just so good. He's like, I want to make this in serial production. And that's how the original 15305 came to be. So, so again, it just goes to show you the incredible watchmaking of AP, who I personally think make the best sports watches on the market. And it starts with this line right here. I think this is really what establishes their dominance as the king of the sports watch, not just because of the Royal Oak, but also the complications that they achieve within the Royal Oak case, a la, for example, the concept line. Or moving on to the offshore lines, again, yeah. such as uh, this Japanese edition, they made, I think, 20 of these. Yes. The Royal Oak concept, now we're going to the school of our favorite school. I think that Renault, and I don't think there's anybody out there that even comes close to Renault and Papi, in fact, of the watchmakers that came out of that, the innovation that came out of there, and everything else. And no wonder Audemars Piguet bought them. Uh, unless you can think of something else. I, I mean, the I, only I, other house in history is really JLC. Um, but in terms of Renault and Papi, but it's not a fair last, comparison. JLC is a monster. Correct. They're, 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 they're a historic house, right? Yes. Over the last 25 years, I don't think that there's been a more groundbreaking think tank for movements, for horology than Renault and Poppy because yeah, let's talk about some of the watchmakers yeah the, the names there. that came out of there from you know Robert Grubel and Stephen Forsey to the Gronfeld brothers to uh, you know even uh, Anthony or William or Anthony de Haas from A Long and Zone now is the head of head of like the their complications I mean you go down the list Carole Forestier who made the UN Free I'm sorry I'm sorry who Carole Forestier she made the UN Free she worked on the Cartier collection what, what, what he said even Peter Speak Marine came yeah. from Renault and Poppy uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the complications... How about that, Richard Mille was born out of... Yeah, Richard, Richard RM001, 0203, you go down the list. These were all complications. And even, you know, you go down to their most innovative and groundbreaking movements, the Bubba Watsons, the Nadals. They're all made by Renault and Poppy. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, there's just, there's just no denying what they've achieved and what they've accomplished in such a short period is nothing short of remarkable. And again, it, I guess you can't say it goes with the time because in the last 30, 40 years, you're talking about technology moving at a pace as it never has done before. Yeah. Um, more things were invented in the last 50 years than ever. It's, again, we're keeping up with the times and horology is definitely not behind. And I think Renault and Pipe is solely responsible for that innovation within the world of horology. But going back to my favorite complication from Audemars Piguet, which is the uh, concept Royal Oak. That's actually a Royal Oak, believe it or not. Not an offshore. It was I, when they came out. When the Alacrae came out, I was like, "How is this a Royal Oak? This is bigger than an offshore, right?" Yeah. It kind of didn't make sense to me. But uh, because look, this this is an offshore and this is a Royal Oak, and it's yeah. bigger. But Alacrae yeah. concept. My favorite complication from AP. From AP. Again, Renault Puppy movement. Uh, the dynamograph was introduced. Uh, we're talking about the selector, the, and the, selector. Uh, fu the function selector, where you would actually change the selector to wind the watch, to set the watch, or to put it in neutral for it to run. It's something that you saw immediately across in the RM002 and then 003. And uh, it, it was absolutely iconic. And of course, uh, you know, we happen to have a much later version. This is actually the first automatic concept that they made. Yeah. Uh, Self-winding concept with a peripheral rotor, and it's actually on the front of the yeah, watch. Yeah, the rotor's in front of the watch. We're talking about this watch being a chronograph there's they do what AP does yeah they started with a 5402 IE a blank canvas and you know this is how it started and this is how it's going yeah. and this is in everything you know here's another offshore tourbillon here again one of those watches that aesthetically you know, listen, they did what has been done. This is a Turbion Chrono, but aesthetically, you know, they're, they're worried about everything. It's material yeah. use, aesthetics. We're talking about rubber. We're talking about ceramic. We're talking about material use. They're taking that blank canvas and they're taking it to such a yeah. level that I can't think of any other company the, that has done that. The offshore, Especially one that's that old. I actually completely agree. The offshore and the concept line have been essentially, uh, 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 how do I put it? It's almost like they're... they're ability to create things freely, right? It's like a, a blank canvas to, to experiment with materials, experiment with complications, experiment with even designs, right? When the Alec Craig concept came out, this was not a watch for its time. It was very futuristic. This was way ahead of its time, even in terms of complications. What material use? Yeah. I didn't even know what Alacrite was until that watch came out. Apparently, Maybe. they make spaceships out of it or something. Yeah. And, and, and again, they take that even a step further because when we talk about AP being, to me, the king of sports watches, period, you look at these these two, which are well, just I the, want the to show finish stops. this. I want to finish this video off with a, I should say, a, not a bang, but a ding, because yeah. uh, those watches actually happen to have a minute repeater as part of the complications that they have. 
when you're talking about it started here, and then you end up with the granddaddy of them all, the grand complication from Audemars Piguet, the very, very thing that started the company that many years ago in a pocket watch, if you will, right? We're talking about something that's out of this world, that's out of its sight, and to me, based on my criteria and the boxes that I want to check off, when you're talking about a high horology timepiece within a sports case, it doesn't get any better than what you see in front of you, and that is the Audemars Piguet Royal Low Grand Complication. A minute repeater, a perpetual calendar, a split second chronograph, and an automatic. I can't, you cannot bring me a sports watch and put on this table that will beat this watch out in terms of the quality of watchmaking with a single watchmaker working on this 648 parts watch. We're talking about a guy that will take it apart, put it together, take it apart, put it together until it's time just right, until it's working just properly. The amount of amplitude, the amount of uh, torque this watch takes to work all these complications and to have them work in unison with a full-blown perpetual and a split-second chronograph and a minute repeater on top yeah. of that, there's nothing out there today that you can argue that will ever beat that. And I, guys, urge you in the comments, if you can come up with a better high horology watch that's made it to the highest standards, yeah. that's put together by hand, that's done by a company that's, that's one of the holy trinity that's been around for a long, long time, continuously, yeah. and that's able to fit all these complications into one iconic case, i.e. the Royal Oak case, feel free to comment below. And if you can and, find me And also in the era that this was done, right? Because again, we talk about you know, modern watchmaking. There's been so many advances, I would say, even in the last 20 years because of the advent of computers, right? Computers have changed the game for watchmakers because they're able to experiment, you know, essentially with, with the use of tech where they, they had to do everything by experimentation in the past. Now, we talk about a watch like this. This started with a blank piece of paper where they made this watch from start to finish, not only a minute repeater, split second chronograph, perpetual calendar, that also is a fully automatic wristwatch, but that is skeletonized and that looks good. Oh yeah, I forgot about the skeleton part of it. Yeah. Aesthetics, right? Aesthetically, yeah. this is, I mean, this is uh, the rose gold version and then you also have the stainless steel version. We also have the bracelet for this somewhere. Although I kind of like the steel on a strap and the rose on a bracelet, I don't know. But the Royal Low case, that blank canvas, that perfect blank canvas, as you dubbed it, has become so popular that it's somewhat overshadowing a lot of the other sticks. And that's the high horology that we're talking about in these watches. Yeah. The finishing, the complications, everything that you see about the watch, the aesthetics of the watch, the use of materials is often overlooked, right? And A, that's the era we were in for quite some time. The good news is that that perfect blank canvas that Gerald Genta designed on the napkin back in 1972 is not going away. This watch, along with the other counterparts of the Holy Trinity, i.e. your Nautiluses, i.e. your overseas, they are truly, truly timeless. And I don't think, no amount of time can go by where you won't see something in a case of a overseas, a Royal Oak or a Nautilus. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think I, I'd want to touch on one last thing, and that is the future of the sports. So you watch. want to have the last word here. Okay, let's go. No, I, I want to have one last question because I, I love your insight, right? We look at how the sports watch market has evolved over the last, let's say, even the last five years with the advent of social media. And you've seen a lot of new risers come to fruition. Richard Mill used to be a closeout brand back in the day. Now they're a watch that you can't even get your hands on at retail, right? You saw the likes of an FP Journe come out with their own sports watch. The likes of an MBNF come out with uh, the Evos, for example, which are flying super high, hugely popular watch. Is Evo tr a true a sports watch? It is, because it has water resistance on a rubber strap. Okay. Uh, so I, w I would consider it definitely on the sports watch genre. Now, what do you think the future of the sports watch is? Is it going to be with these historic players, or is there a, a greater future for these new brands, these FP Journe, essentially the, the, the independents that have come and... Here's my, here's, here's my opinion, and I'll, I'd like to make an analogy, if you don't mind. Uh, let's look at sports, right? The ultimate measurement of competition, right? Human sports. Uh, if you look at the level of a basketball game, and this is the argument that almost got you killed with Gary when you were arguing who's better, LeBron <laughs> or Michael Jordan, right? And we're not going to argue about that. And please, let's not comment who's better. Well, if you can, if you want to, just to prove Marco wrong. But you look at it from when you were arguing with Gary in regards to LeBron versus uh, Michael Jordan, you, were t well, you took a very technical approach. And in a sense, 
one can't, it's hard to argue, it was hard to disagree with you that LeBron potentially is better than that of Michael Jordan. But that's not the argument here. The argument here is this. If you look at the level of play across any major sport, you can look at tennis, you can look at uh, golf, you can look at uh, uh, tougher sports, i.e. football, soccer, basketball, baseball. If you take a top team in any one of those sports, or top players in any one of those sports, and you plug them back into 50 years ago, okay, they wouldn't stand a chance. Every Olympics, new records are set, Yeah. right? Every game, there's a potential of other records being set, or plays that in a particular sport that you are amazed to see. Serves are being served much faster, right, in tennis. There's all these things that happen over time. Humans evolve in the sports genre for the better. Now, here's where I'm going with this analogy. You're smiling because you probably know where I'm going <laughs> with this. It's not like sports. It is very difficult to knock off number one, two, or three in the world of horology, in the world of horology versus in the world of sports. Because in the world of sports, every year, every decade, every two decades, records are broken, new records are set, humans are evolving to be physically better. But when it comes to watches, how long has the Rolex Daytona been sitting in a number one spot? Yeah. And what are the chances of that watch getting, ever getting knocked off? Yeah, legacy. And that, legacy, and that's the difference, which is why I believe that in the future, yes, you're gonna have a rise of a whole new genre. These independent watchmakers are the future, but them knocking off the Holy Trinity, what's the proper way to put it? Shit is not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's my opinion, that's, that's, that's where I stand Rolex. on this. I may be wrong. Yeah. You know, this is my opinion, but that's how I feel about it, and that's, and that's how I'm going to answer your question. And guys, I'm going to thank you for hopefully sticking around till the end of this video. And uh, as always, hit like, comment, sh as always, hit like, comment, share, subscribe. What else? The bell, the, all the buttons that are underneath the video, minus except for the thumbs down button. Hit all those. We'll see you on the next video. Don't forget to give Marco a follow on his Instagram. He answers his DMs. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers.